Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Um, we're doing some biochar right now. So the weather has kind of gotten down a little cooler and that is a perfect time to have a fire and make some 2000 year old soil amendment. Stick around. So um, it's been hard to make videos because basically they put us back to work. So I'm an office worker and we're back to the office. So that means that uh, with the com uh, commute to work, I'm going to work when it's dark and I come home when it's dark. So it's really hard to get anything done um, and especially to make videos. It was a lot easier when I could get off my shift, didn't have a commute uh, to work and I could actually pump out a video. So sorry for no videos in a while. Um, kind of, it's the time of the season, there's no sunlight. Anyone new to my channel, a lot of what I kind of teach in gardening is to mimic nature whenever you can because nature's kind of already got all this figured out. So a forest fire is actually a very important part um, of forest management. I know that forest fires get a lot of hate for what's going on in you know Brazil, California, British Columbia, West Coast, uh, North America, um, but forest fires are actually extremely important because they uh, stabilize the carbon in the tree and they send it to the ground and then that carbon gets put into the ground so charcoal being cycled trees being cycled into charcoal down onto the ground is actually a really really important cycle so what i do is any kind of prunings that i have to do get put into piles for wildlife it's a good way to stack functions um, to dry the wood and also have it be somewhat useful for your food forest. There's lots of snakes and other critters, chipmunks or whatever, that will nest and live inside here while it dries out. So here's another one, just pruned wood trimmings that I stack on top of itself and put it in a place out of the way to dry and then also function as wildlife habitat. This will all turn into biochar. Now, biochar is something that you may not have to do very often actually at all, especially if you have a small project. It's a 2000 year soil amendment. So you can take your prunings and cuttings and make biochar with it. Um, harvest that heat ideally for something else at the same time. Uh, but because it's a 2000 year soil amendment, you may not really have to do it very often. It could be just a once and done. And also it could just be an optional, you don't have to do it. It's kind of a way to next level your garden. So the idea behind biochar is that if we can vacate the gases out of wood, then um, there's a, it basically forms like a honeycomb structure with the carbon that make the cell walls of the plant. When we hollow that out, it turns into basically soil microbiology hotel rooms. And also what you're left with is a bunch of carbon bonds that are available to bind things to it. So whether that's water or nutrient that washes away uh, with the rains, when you have a little bit of biochar in your soil, it acts as a soak, a stop, a collection point for all those nutrients and water to hold in your soil. Soils amended with biochar have tremendous water retention capabilities which means every time it rains, you're storing and holding that much more water. Okay, so how this works is we basically want to have um, a pyrolysis reaction. We don't want combustion. We want this to burn in the absence of oxygen. So we fill some kind of container um, as tightly packed as we can. We leave a layer at the top to be opened. Now you can do this with a steel drum like this. Um, you can just do it by digging a trench and digging a pit and having the earth be the bottom. Um, but we want uh, air infiltration into the fire to be as minimized as possible. And then we want the fire to be burnt from the top. And we want the heat from the top to drive the gases from the wood inside up and then they get recombusted and then that heat is used to drive more gases up. So once it's going, it's a self-sustaining reaction until all the gases in the wood have been vacated and combusted and burned. It's a very clean burn because all the exhaust gases were recombusting. So most of what is leaving this burn is actually just water vapor. Um, it's a, so it, it's very important it's a very clean burn because we want to be as uh, environmentally conscious as possible. And basically this is going to take 
about 60% of the carbon in this wood um, and um, store it into the ground for 2,000 years. Okay, so as we go, um, we don't want uh, ash to be made. So we don't want the charcoal to be combusted and consumed and turned into ash. So what we'll actually do is take a tamper and we will kind of tamp it down and get those charcoal particles to fall to the bottom. And it's obviously easier to do it two-handed. Um, those charcoal particles will fall to the bottom, we'll fill it back with more wood and we want that combustion, we want the flame layer to be uh, at the top because we do want to recombust, we want to drive those gases out and then recombust them. And then when we're all done and we filled up and it's not really compressing down anymore or we just run out of wood, then we basically quench it to stop the fire and we're going to actually fill it with water. Um, because there's so much residual heat in there that it'll continue actually driving heat out and you'll wake up in the next morning and it'll, you'll have a bucket full of ash. So you want to fill it up with water when you're done. So the reason why we're doing this biochar burn actually is because uh, we actually have our first consultation job. So a watcher reached out to me and he's fairly local and he wants me to design his suburban backyard. He just bought a house and he wants to start it off the right way and put a food forest in his backyard. It's a uh, 40 foot by about uh, maybe 25 foot backyard with a fairly large patio in it. Um, so it, you know, maximizing space is going to be very important. But uh, we're going to get a lot of fruit trees in there. I'm guessing somewhere between 10 to 14 fruit trees will spoliar some up against the uh, the fence. And uh, we've already got the backyard. Um, sheet mulching so the soil is already starting to build and turn into fungal soil and more importantly maybe is that this winter all the snow melt is actually going to captured and stored in the wood chips so if you start your garden in the spring you kind of miss the opportunity to capture all that uh, snow melt so uh, he's off to a really good start we're going to start his project in the spring and uh, it's going to be very exciting. It'll be the first uh, food forest that I help someone else build. And uh, I'm just honored that someone wants me to, you know, to take on that kind of job and um, be part of it. Okay, so here we go. This is the final product. We've uh, dumped about 40 liters of, uh, of water into this, which kind of shows you how much heat is in this. Um, this is the final product here. So pretty good stuff and it just crumbles apart. You want it baked the whole way through. So some of these pieces, I think most of these pieces are baked all the way through. There might be some in there that aren't, but uh, it's pretty good. So now we're going to let this cool overnight um, and we will put it into compost tomorrow. So stick around and I'll see you tomorrow. Um, now one reason I really wanted to make biochar is that uh, his soil in his backyard, it looks like it's maybe about a 40 year old house or something like that. And the backyard is just grass that's basically depleted the soil. So there's no nutrient in that soil left and it's going to be bacterial if anything. So I really wanted to give him a head start and give him like, you know, a premium product that you can't buy anywhere. All right, manure, compost, uh, biochar mix, soil amendment. So we're gonna um, give that to him and we're making it today. So actually, I think I'm gonna leave this video here today um, and we will inoculate this stuff tomorrow. And inoculating it is very important because this is like an empty, char uh, an empty battery that has a massive charge potential, but it's empty. And it's got a charge with nutrient and water and soil microbiology. Now I douse this with water from the pond. Now uh, I don't know how much of that's going to survive because you know this was very hot. I'm sure some of it will. The thermal capacity of the water will probably protect it. But um, we're going to go a step further and we're going to put this into a really good uh, third manure, third compost, uh, and third kitchen scraps, um, kind of half finished compost, maybe even a little bit of wood chips. Uh, and a good, nice uh, mix comp. So we want to go inoculate this and I will do that tomorrow. And one last thing, um, we have a ash tree here that's clearly dead. I've been meaning to take down most of my ash trees that show signs of uh, 
Emerald Ash Borer boring. This one I missed, or I didn't miss it, I knew about it and I got lazy taking it down because other priorities were higher. And nature said, screw you in particular and dropped it right on this pawpaw. So I don't know how many people know about pawpaws if you've seen any of my other videos, but they need two different genetics uh, species to cross pollinate. They can't be, uh, they can be seedlings because seedlings will be genetically different, but they can't be clones of each other. This one here and this one here, I believe are clones of each other because I bought them from the same nursery. So they're probably the same rootstock and the same scion wood grafted onto it. So they're probably genetically identical. So I got an extra pawpaw and planted it here and it's a little behind the other two. Um, just it was smaller when I put it in and I since have purchased, sorry for swinging the camera, um, another one here. Now the one that I just showed you was this size last year, well, a little bit bigger. So this one I'm expecting to be three times that height next year hopefully, a little smaller than this one. But the tree fell right on top. This is me moving it over. It literally fell right on the cage. And there's some damage, but overall, I actually think it came out relatively unscathed. So hopefully those wounds don't translate into a dead tree this winter. Um, but it is what it is. So kind of funny. You protect against as many things as you can and then nature dumps a, an ash tree on it. Any other tree, fine. But my... My only pawpaw genetic difference that'll probably pollinate with these ones next year. No, no, don't touch that. Uh, that's what it is. See you on the next one. Tomorrow I'll update you on um, inoculating that biochar, so stay tuned for part two. Thanks for watching, guys.